Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me. I'm Tim Laskus and you're listening to The Tim Laskus Show. This is episode 80. And today's featured guest is Morton Metalfart. Well, I should actually say Dr. Morton because he has two PhDs. Man, I've got one and that was way too much for me to do. I would never consider doing another one and he has two and he actually also has another degree. I believe he has an MBA. So, he holds all kinds of degrees, but he's figured out how to crack the Twitter code and his company focuses on helping you build your brand by cracking the Twitter code. His company is called socialquant.net and he is just a very bright guy. He's very scientific and he understands business and algorithms and systems and he brings all this together to help his clients and i know you're going to enjoy this episode so sit back and enjoy the tim laska show in search of entrepreneurial gold tim digs deep into the minds of his guests entertaining down to earth and informative now here's your host tim laskus Hey, you were telling me that you love to just throw yourself out of planes while you're down in Florida. What's that all about? Uh, well, you know, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a great experience to be skydiving. And uh, to me, it's really a, a mental exercise where you, uh, you have uh, this, this uh, falling dream uh, that is built into all of us. Or, well, I, I actually have done studies on this. So 75% will have the dream of falling down uh, and then wake up right before they hit the ground. So in other words, that's not an experience. That's something that was built into us. So to me, skydiving is challenging the, uh, the fear, not just the experiences that, uh, that bring fear to our lives, but really the built-in DNA level type of fear. Uh, so I guess that's kind of like the, the, the main thing about it. And then on top of that, it's just fun. So, um, a little bit of both, I guess. Yeah, well, I, I would be too scared to do that. I think I would probably wet myself or something if I... Did that once those doors open and I see the how tiny the trees are? <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to be high on that Yerkes Dotson scale. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where as arousal level goes up, your thought process goes down. So, um, yeah, that that would be difficult. But anyway, let's go on to what you're doing professionally, Morton. Tell tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and where what are you currently working on? Well, I'm currently working on uh, I would say uh, a lot of projects involving big data and. Uh, algorithms, uh, you know, the AI, the data mining type uh, stuff that process large amounts of data. Uh, so uh, I, I have a background in, uh, in analyzing data since the early 90s, and I built my first company in 96. So ever since then, I've been in this field and uh, have enjoyed it very much. So most recently, I feel uh, with the internet, uh, we have now suddenly such large amounts of data and it's really like a gold mine of lots of interesting data, interesting trends that you can find. However, in order to find the golden nuggets, if you will, you need to use specialized tools that are seeking much deeper than the human mind and eye can see. And, um, and uh, so those type of algorithms that process those data is my field and you know you can you can apply that to both social media you can apply that to you know risk management you can apply that to cyber security and those are the uh let's say three manifestations uh, of, of such technology that i'm working on right now so is that kind of what your focus is is to create systems that gets in there and digs into the dirt of the, all this data and then sifts it out and makes sense of it so that people can use it in a in a an effective way. Exactly. And there's really two sides to that. One way is that you let the system make its own decisions, which are, you know, in my opinion, the most interesting systems. On the other hand, that is in many ways not very, uh, you know, that's not possible all the time, especially when you're dealing with a certain type of problem that do not occur as frequent as, say, somebody posts a picture with a cat online. I don't know if you noticed that a lot of the algorithms out there in terms of uh, image recognition are about finding cats. That's simply because there's a lot of images out there. But let's say certain type of real corporate risk, they are problems that you don't have like thousands and thousands of examples. 
So that means that your algorithms have to be a little bit more sophisticated. And on top of that, the highest the algorithm can hope to, to, uh, to go is to alert a human that will then have to assess the risk. So I'm very much interested in problems that are not so easy to solve uh, as the traditional you know, um, machine learning applications that we hear about every day, uh, but still using algorithms to, to, uh, to attack those problems, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And what is one of your more recent companies that's looking into data? What, what kind of data is it looking into and how does it help uh, its users? Oh, uh, I, I think that probably the best one to, uh, to mention here is Social Quant, uh, a company I launched back in 2014. That company can help everybody get a lot of bandwidth on Twitter. And if you uh, get that bandwidth on Twitter, then you could use that either to you know, build your personal brand, your company's brand, or you know, just, just um, you know, push an idea, you know, if you will. Uh, or you can move that traffic to your website. Uh, and thereby get uh, typically four times the uh, amount of bandwidth uh, uh, on your website as you would get through traditional search engine optimization. So um, if you look at it, it's, it's an algorithmic approach to connecting with the right people, and the gain of that is uh, a lot of traffic to your website typically, or a lot of, uh, what do you say, um, a lot of bandwidth on whatever idea you're seeking to. Right. to uh, communicate. Now, what, what's the name of that company and, and, and spell it for the listeners out there? Uh, Social Quant, and it's S-O-C-I-A-L-Q-U-A-N-T, dot net, I should say. Dot net, okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I first heard this from Soren of Tribe of Entrepreneurs, and he had used your service, I think, maybe before he had you on his show, and he was telling me, he's like, this guy Morton is incredible. He said he was talking about his Twitter account, how it just exploded, and, and it's the real deal. And, and a lot of times, you know, we hear about different companies that do different things. And, you know, this was a guy that that was able to say, hey, I used it. I used his service, and it it brought big value. So he was so impressed with what uh, Social Quant has done for him. Oh, I'm very happy to hear. It's always uh, motivating to to hear that people have great experiences. And what made you kind of come up with that? And now, what, Social Quant really focuses just on Twitter. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the the reason I did Social Quant was uh, was specifically because I uh, was working for a analytics tool company. Uh, in fact, it was the technology I built back in the '90s, uh, and um, and that, that company uh, seemed to just be very focused on internal data, the data that you traditionally analyze, your, your ERP data, your CRM, whatever data you have, you know, your finance systems and so forth, right? Uh, and, and I wanted to work on all the opposite data. <laughs> Maybe you see a pattern here. Whenever there's something that becomes mainstream, I want to do the, diff- <laughs> the opposite of that, uh, the, the different type of problem. So I wanted to, to look into you know, working on all the data that you do not have as a company and then do meaningful algorithms that have business value. And um, the closest thing I had, I had a little, you know, side project where I had a lot of experience with Twitter already. So it was just the quickest way for me to get to launching a, you know, a valuable product that I could start selling since I left that company. So, So it was a little bit of a coincidence, but then again, maybe not, because I already had a lot of experience with Twitter um, and, and experiments uh, that, that were, were working. Now, can you take what you've done with Twitter and creating social quant? Can you replicate this for, say, a Facebook or an Instagram or, or one of the other social media sites? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it, w- it would be probably most likely be a, an open-ended network, the uh, the, the nature of Twitter, uh, where I can follow you, but you do not have to follow me, those type of networks are, are the ones that my algorithm is, is optimized for. That means that probably an Instagram would be the, you know, the most likely candidate for something like this, uh, whereas you know, the LinkedIn and the Facebook, they kind of like want to verify you, you know, saying, if I say I know you, you have to say on the other end that you know me and you want to connect with me. So... Uh, the open-ended networks are a lot more, in my opinion, powerful 
news travel faster, they expand in a different way. Um, and, uh, and um, yeah, so that's just been my area of interest. But I'm sure somebody else could do something with the close end. Well, that that is excellent. And, um, you, you know, Morton, you were, we were talking earlier before we started recording, and, and you said you don't you, you do not consider yourself an entrepreneur. And, and that, that was quite interesting since, you know, you, you've been starting companies, you know, going back to 96. Um, you, why is it that you do not consider yourself an entrepreneur? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a good question. I think that uh, back in the day, we were just uh, we were not talking so much about entrepreneurship. Uh, as I feel we are today. Today it's more like, as if being an entrepreneur sounds as a profession. And I, I don't consider myself a, a professional starter of businesses. I consider myself a computer scientist or just a scientist, if you will. And in order to play with the technologies that, um, that I like and, and problems that I find intriguing, I need to typically build a company in order you know, to, to fit into how the world works, uh, and and so to me the the surroundings of of a interesting computer system, an algorithm, some big data, and all that has to be a company in order for for it to make sense, in order for it to to do its thing and 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 deliver something to other people in this world. But but that's more like a to me it's 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 just a a tool. Um, so so like I said, it's the core, it's the heart of whatever it is we do that uh, is much more interesting to me. So I wouldn't be offended in any way if somebody called me a computer scientist, a scientist, or even a computer nerd. Uh, <laughs> I'm not offended by being called an entrepreneur, right? But, but I, I just don't, you know, I don't feel it as much as I feel all the stuff that has to do with computers. <laughs> right, right. Well, so I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And it seems like you, you jump in there and you really want to understand or, or you do understand algorithms. And that's really what your interest is. But building a, a company around that to actually you know, make money and generate income is a different skill set was you know my brother is is an engineer and and he's always developing things and and he has great ideas but sometimes you know he he struggles a little bit and being able to execute and build a company around you know that product or whatever he's developing was that difficult for you to to learn that skill set of building a company around these algorithm algorithms and understanding you know the data uh i no i i have not really found that so uh so difficult I completely agree with what you're saying. Uh, that that that's something that you can sometimes observe uh, entrepreneurship-wise. That you know, getting the product to market, uh, launching it. But I guess I feel that to me, that's part of the experiment. I don't think that you build beautiful technology unless it's applicable. So so uh, maybe think of it a little bit more as I consider the customer part of the system. I don't consider it me building a box, and then once I feel it's perfect, then I go to market. I don't consider it that you have a product until somebody pays you for it. So you you want to do the entire process end to end. So so I I think like that about the entire system, and that at least means that I'll have paying customers before I feel I build a product. <laughs> right. But uh, but you know I I I, I haven't seen that as as big a, a challenge, but I, I definitely will recognize that you probably don't want me to, you know, build a large scaling sales organization. That's, that's definitely not my skills. And I've seen that in the companies that I've worked with, that that's, that's where we really need to bring somebody in. But in order to go to the, you know, the first customers and, and look them in the eye and say, yes, this will be awesome. And then, you know, even, you know, get myself to say, here's the invoice, you know, that I, I, I haven't had a problem with getting to that first stage of building a company. Before. I see. So it's a systems approach. Your, your lens at looking at this, it, 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 it's all interconnected. Um, and, and so, yeah. you know, the, the algorithms and, and the data is just one part of, of that entire system. So you, you have a really clear vision of what the system is around that. So that makes a lot of sense. And you said something earlier about, you know, being able to, to have paying customers prior to building that actual product. Is that what you were saying? Uh, I know I was saying uh, that you got to have paying customers as early as possible. Uh, and you may have years for version how it could all get better, but getting to the point where you have a full uh, cycle of 
you know, development to customer, to someone that you're paying you back. <laughs> and, and, you know, you got to have that entire pipeline up and going as fast as possible. And then once you, you know, you, you start generating revenue, then, of course, you can enhance your services and do more. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so it's not, it's, it's, it's the entire, you know, the end to end, if that makes sense. Right. And I'm sure a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of listeners out there who are entrepreneurs and just starting out. And that's a really common occurrence is, is someone will work on a product or a service and then the ball just kind of gets dropped and it never gets to that next level where they get paying customers and they're not bringing them in fast enough. And then the, the kind of the whole thing just kind of disappears like a cloud in the sky. And, uh, I, th- I think that's a common occurrence, and I, and I liked how you talk about get it, you know, to market as fast as possible. And and would you agree that some people just they just spend too much time trying to get everything perfect before they bring it to market? Oh, I, I think that's a very common, uh, you know, pitfall to uh, you know uh, to not just go for what we call minimum viable product as fast as possible, and then see how that works because it's almost guaranteed that a lot of the things that you thought when you built a product were not exactly how the customer perceived them. So therefore you're going to have to change stuff anyway. And the sooner you get to inter- interact with real customers, the better, because you're not really done until you you're able to do that. Um, and then obviously you don't really want to listen to everybody. You only want to listen to the customers that actually pay because it's easy to get a lot of feedback, but that may not be relevant. Uh, I don't really listen to anybody who's not willing to pay because that means that they, their feedback is really not relevant. I, uh, at the end of the day, I want to end up with all the customers paying. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I, I love that. And, and yeah, there's so many, so much kind of chatter out there that, you know, a lot of people are willing to give it, you know, advice on, on something, but they don't have any skin in the game. So I think that's a great tip is to have, you know, actually listen to your paying customers first. Um, now, Morton, did you, you know, you said you built your first company in 96. Did, did you always have this kind of, you know, spirit and drive to create a, a, a company? I mean, did this start early on as, as a child? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, I, have you asked me in, uh, in my, uh, you know, in my, uh, let's say teens, I mean, I, I got to be a programmer professionally since I was 14. So that means that I already was working in the industry, uh, and making money. Uh, but what I, what I wanted to do, uh, when I was 18, I joined the army and became an army officer. And I thought when I was in the army, I wanted to be in the army forever, you know, like a lifetime career. And I got accepted uh, to, to go all, through all those programs. I could essentially stay there uh, for the, you know, for, uh, you know, my entire career. Um, but, uh, but then, you know, I just got the idea that I wanted to go commercial. It was just a friend of mine that uh, started working for Maersk or he, he um, and, um, and I applied to, and Maersk at the time was considered like the Google of Denmark in the 90s. It was the coolest company to work for. Everybody wanted to be there. Uh, and I, you know, I got accepted in there too with my friend. And then I changed into Maersk. And that's when I kind of like computing came back and haunted me. I, I actually tried to stay away from computing because I wanted to do purely commercial, purely shipping. And I knew that if people found out what I could do with computers, then I'd be working with computers forever. But all the stuff I saw was, <laughs> was uh, that, that there were so many people struggling with computers. There was so much to be done that could be done, but nobody knew how to do it. And then finally, I just gave in and said, okay, I'll help you. And then my shipping career went all computers. I got involved in big data projects of the time in the early 90s, like huge data warehouses, a uh, lot of data. And, and that's really what, what then taught me that. If, if you know, it, it's kind of like a progression of just looking at problems. When I looked at the problems of Maersk, then I decided to see if I could help, and then I got they they dragged me into it, so to speak. Like it, <laughs> I, it was like a vortex. I got sucked into all these problems of computing, mm-hmm. and then once I learned that since the coolest company in Denmark had all these problems, then I was like, I think there is a business because clearly somebody else will have problems like the. The, the smaller companies of Denmark and all all of the world, right? So 
So that's when I launched my, my first company in, in 96. So definitely not that I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Interesting. It's more like I, uh, it was just the problems uh, presenting themselves and then I just pursued them. Well, it sounds or, like you caught... A lot. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I, yeah. Well, I was going to say, it sounds like you caught the computer <sighs> bug and it made its way into your DNA or, and you've you never been able to shake it. So... Um, yeah, it's it, it's ingrained. You you're never going to get away from it at this point because you've been super successful. But uh, yeah, there is one thing though that one of the things that I I do know that I've been wanting to do, uh, you know, since my very early childhood, since I started programming.